about God's great gifts at Christmas. Think, if you will, of all the customs that you have been a part of uh, over all the Christmas seasons that you've experienced. Think of all the different customs that uh, you have made your own. Customs that you were born into. Maybe customs that you picked up when you uh, traveled uh, to other parts of the country. Maybe you lived somewhere else for a while. We have a few customs that we picked up when we lived in New Mexico in the Southwest. Uh, think of all the different customs. Of all the customs of Christmas, like, like, like we had tamales last night with some friends at our gospel community meeting. That's one. That's a solid Christmas tradition, right? If you haven't had uh, tamales yet, uh, you're late because, because we, we do that around here. Uh, we, we put up Christmas trees all over. Uh, and those of you with allergies suffer through the season because it's a tradition and you want to do it. We hang lights uh, all over everything. You put up uh, a nativity scene. Maybe you call it something else, but you put a nativity scene up in your house. Uh, we have one here in the church. But of all the different customs, all the different traditions that, that are attached to the Christmas season, what is that one custom that is most distinctive of the holiday season, of Christmas time? The one custom that is most distinctive is the giving of gifts. I think it would be hard to challenge that statement. The one most significant custom of the Christmas season is the giving of gifts. And a unique detail about Christmas, while there are lots of celebrations where we, the many, give gifts to that one person, Valentine's Day, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthdays, we give, we give gifts to one person. One person is put on a pedestal and, and we shower that one person with gifts. Christmas is unique because it's a celebration where everybody gets gifts. Everybody gives gifts to everybody. To the degree that if you're that person in the room, like you forgot to, 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 to go shout, you, you didn't bring a gift for everybody in the room, it's super awkward. You've probably been in that situation before. I, I think you have. Um, 20 years ago, uh, when, 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 uh, when our kids, uh, when our, our oldest kids now, who are in their 20s, uh, 20 years ago, when they were just little, I mean, just just like preschoolers, and we would come home to South Texas every Christmas, every year, uh, on, Christmas, <clears throat> on Christmas Eve, um, we would get together with extended family, and my cousin's wife would bring gifts for all of our kids. It made us look bad, and we, we were too busy or we were too poor, I guess, to, to, to get gifts for all of, of her kids. We, we had driven all the way from New Mexico, and we had just slid in. In some cases, we had only been in town for hours, and, and, and we only saw him once a year. You know all the excuses. We'd only saw him once, uh, saw him once a year, uh, and we only saw him for a couple of hours, and, and and it was Christmas Eve, and it didn't seem to me that it was necessary to buy gifts for all of her children, even though she had done that for us every year. And I would forget until the Christmas Eve, and then I remember, oh yeah, we never get them gifts, and they always get us gifts. And, and it was one of those awkward moments. Looking back, I think I was wrong about that. I think my attitude was, was a bad attitude. Because Christmas is a time when we get gifts for everybody. Like something for everyone. Like Oprah, you know, a gift for you and a gift for you and a gift for you, right? Something for everyone. And I think that's good. I think that's right because it highlights the central theme of Christmas, which we're going to talk about today. And I've heard others say, I've heard you say that, that Christmas is it's not about gifts. And I understand that perspective. 
uh, when we talk about the fact that, that Christmas has been over-commercialized. I understand that. I, I would agree with th- that point. However, the central theme of Christmas is a gift. We think of the first Christmas story. We look at the nativity scene. We have one on, on the table just back there. We, we think of the first Christmas story and, and baby, baby Jesus and the manger and, and the shepherds and, and later came the wise men with their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh in these, in these pretty little boxes. And we, and, and we think about others bringing gifts to Jesus. That's what we think about on Christmas. Let's give our, we say this in church sometimes to try and get you to give more money to the church. We say, we say let's bring our best gift to Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with, I mean, it's good to give your, your resources to the church. That is, that is a good and fine way to, 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 to invest your finances. But, but, but bringing our best gift to Jesus, that's cool and all, but that's not really what Christmas is about. Actually, the story of Christmas is a story about God being an extravagant gift giver. Not about God receiving gifts, but about God being a gift giver. Ultimately, sacrificial. See, Jesus was, we use the term born, and and he was. Jesus was born at Christmas. But if you read the text all over the scriptures really carefully, what you realize is Jesus didn't just come. Scripture says that he was given as a gift. And it said, it's that, that, that word is given uh, or gift is used enough in scripture that it must mean something. It must be there on purpose. We've got a few examples. Isaiah 9 chapter 6, a really famous a really famous uh, scripture, Christmas scripture passage is Isaiah 9, 6. It says, for unto us a son is given. It doesn't just say that he was born, but it says that he is, is given. One of the most famous um, Bible verses in general that you probably have memorized is John three sixteen, And you remember it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And I could go on and on and show you many and various examples in the Bible of Jesus' birth being described as a gift given. We'll look at a few more this morning. But the words of Scripture are carefully chosen. Jesus wasn't simply born for we know that we, we know we, we studied Genesis a few uh, over the fall. We know that, that the Bible reveals that Jesus always existed as a member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has always been around. He, he, was, he was there at creation. No one created Jesus. He is eternal. He's always existed long before he was born, long before he became a human being. He was already God. So, so Jesus wasn't just born like that started his existence by no means. He wasn't just born. He was, he was given. It was a gift. Here's what we're talking about today, really. What I want to convince you to believe is that God giving Jesus as a gift is significant in that it gives us a logic, a reason for following Jesus, for being a Christian, for, <clears throat> for deciding rather than going my own way, I am going to go follow God and go the direction of Jesus. There is, there is a logic to that. We tend to think that, that Christianity is just It's just emotion, that it's just your own uh, opinion, that it cannot be justified, that there is no logic behind it. And what I want to do today is is show you from Scripture that, that, that because God has given you the gift 
of Jesus. If you believe that, now if you don't believe that, all bets are off. But if you believe that and you are a Christian, there is a, a logic, there is a reason behind your pursuits in life, the way that you are choosing to live. In other words, why do we do what we do as Christians? Why do we live for a different king? And why do we live for a, a different kingdom than the rest of the world? Like, like there are people who are, who are living for the, the kingdom of the, the, this kingdom of, the, of, the, of this world and, and the, this economy and this system and, and, and all that comes with it. And then there are those of us who say, no, we're living for a different king and we're living for a different kingdom and our, our motivations are different. Not that we're judging you. It's just we're on a different path for a different reason, seeking a different prize, chasing after a different goal. There's a logic behind that. And Christmas gives us that logic for seeking first the kingdom of God. See, there's, there are those who, who maybe on their spare time seek the kingdom of God second or third or fourth. But no, as a Christian, if you are a Christian, then you are to seek first the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, and all those other things, they'll be added on, but you seek first the kingdom of God. And if that's not what you're doing, then you can't really uh, identify as a Christian. Because Jesus says, to be a Christian, to follow me, what you do is you seek, you seek the kingdom of God first. And all those other things will be added unto you. You want to know why it's sensible to follow Christ? That's what we're talking about today. Think on this. When you receive a gift, I'll just tell you how I am. When I receive a gift, I often, I often use that gift, especially if it's a good gift. I use it as a rationale for believing that someone is for me. Like, well, he gave me a gift... He must be for me, unless it's like a trick, like you open it up, it's not what you thought it was, you know, one of, them, one of them rubber snakes jumps out. But if it's like a really, like a legitimate gift, you're like, well, okay, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. He must be for me, because after all, he gave me a gift. He's on my side. Once someone uh, gave us a car, that's a pretty cool gift. And when you get a really cool gift like that, what you wonder is, uh, you wonder a couple things. First of all, like, is there more where that came from? But then you start to wonder, like, this person must really, really be for me. Really be on my side. A rationale for seeking first the kingdom of God can be found in the gifts of that come from God. Let's, let's look at Romans chapter 8. By the way, you want to spend a year, we're moving, into, we're moving into a new year, 2019. You want to spend a year studying one chapter of the Bible, just one chapter. Not the whole Bible, not, 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 not one testament, not a book, just one chapter. Hang out in Romans 8 for 2019 and, 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 and you will be blessed. Romans 8 chapter 30, uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 32. A rationale for seeking first the kingdom of God. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. There's that word again. God, who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? There it is. Why heaven makes sense. Why seeking the kingdom of God makes sense. You say, where, Randy? I don't, I don't understand. Well, here's what's going on. In this passage, Paul is using a formal type of, of logic that argues uh, from the stronger 
to the weaker, from the more significant to the less significant. What he's saying is this. It, if, if this, what, what, what God did in not sparing his own son, giving up his own son for your salvation, sending his own son, God the Son, to the earth, that God the Son might take on your sins and pay the penalty for your sins so that you get off scot-free, uh, so that you're, you're forgiven. He takes your sin, you're forgiven, if God would do that, the big thing, the difficult thing, won't he do the simpler thing? It, it, it's, a, it's a form of logic arguing from the stronger to the weaker. Paul says, if, if God is willing to do the hard thing, and that is sacrificing his son for you, don't you think he's going to do the easier thing? Working out all the other troubles of your life? I'll give you an illustration of this sort of logic. Imagine if I asked Boyce, my son who is nine years old, he's our youngest. Imagine if I asked Boyce to go next door and ask Mr. Sparrow if he would be willing to loan us, if we could borrow a fishing rod. Just for a couple of hours. We're just going to fish in the Rosaka. Go ask Mr. Sparrow if we can borrow a fishing rod for a couple of hours. And what if Boyce were to say, well, maybe Mr. Sparrow doesn't want to loan us a fishing rod. And if I were to use the Apostle Paul's reasoning here, his logic, then I would say something like this. I would say, son, boys, son, Mr. Sparrow loaned me his boat for the entire day last week. Son, I am sure that if Mr. Sparrow was willing to loan me his boat for an entire day, he will be more than happy to loan us his fishing rod for a few hours. Now, now go get it and let's go fishing. And, and off he goes to ask Mr. Sparrow if we can borrow his rod. And the reasoning behind this is that a boat, uh, especially Mr. Sparrow's boat, is a very expensive boat, uh, is worth way more than a fishing rod. And that the, fact that he, the fact that he loaned me the boat for a day, a day is way longer than a couple of hours. And if Mr. Sparrow is willing to do the harder thing, then surely he is willing to do the easier thing. And so, so the Apostle Paul is saying, if God the Father was willing to do the hardest thing that has ever been done in the history of doing things, don't you think he's going he's gonna to work on the smaller things? I use this reasoning when I lay in bed at night, and I worry. I tell myself, if I am truly seeking the kingdom of God first, then I am obligated to believe that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for me. And then I think what that means as a dad, I think of, I think of men Sending of a father sending his son off to war, and and then I think of other ways in which which people are sacrificial, and then I realize, but 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 God the Father, his his sacrifice was 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 exponentially greater and more extravagant than that for me. 
And I say, so if I'm going to believe this with all my heart, and if I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God, and I'm going to, I should rest well tonight. <laughs> Trusting that he, he, I don't need to sweat the small things. He's on it. Let me ask you, what is the most difficult hurdle ever cleared in the salvation of the lost? More, more, more personally, in order for you to be saved, like you're, you're guilty, like I'm guilty, we were born sinners, God cannot cannot stand sin, and so there's this separation, we're born. Ever since Adam and Eve uh, committed the first sin, we've all been separated from God, and there's this chasm that God seeks to, to close, to he, to, so that we might no longer be separated from him, that our sins might be forgiven. We become children of God. Now, in the, in the bridging of that gap, in the forgiving of our sins, what do you think is the, the greatest hurdle? And, and don't answer out loud, but, but probably where our mind usually goes, probably is like, well, my sin. Like, I'm, I'm, I, you don't know half of my sins, Pastor. And, and I would say back to you, you don't know half of my sins because I'm way more like you than you think I am. And, and so, so we might say the greatest hurdle in, 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 our, in our forgiveness, in our salvation, the greatest hurdle that must be cleared is our sin. And I would say to you, that's, that's a great hurdle but that's, and that's a good answer and I understand that answer, but I don't think that's the right answer. I believe that the greatest, most difficult hurdle ever cleared was the love of the Father for His Son. Think about that. I think there was a time in which the God in, in, in His kingdom had to determine, I will, I will send my Son to earth. And he will, he will die on a cross. And I will, to use scriptural scripture words from scripture i will i will forsake my son and i will take the the sin of the world and i will pile it on my son to the degree that i have to turn my back and forsake him and he will cry out to me why have you forsaken me and and, and then he will say it is finished and it'll all be done and god knows ultimately it is for my son's glory ultimately it is for the salvation of the world but but i I will do this. The greatest hurdle ever cleared for my salvation, for your salvation, is the love of the Father for the Son. And God, and God cleared that hurdle, not sparing His Son, but rather giving Him over. And so Paul's point is, if God is willing to do that, don't you think He's willing to do the easier things? give you everything else that you need in life? Won't he, won't he do that? Jesus' words, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Don't you think that God will graciously give you everything else that you need? He is for you, as, as, as the Apostle Paul says. Who can be against you? In light of the fact that God is for you, who can really come against you? They will try. There will be dark days, but ultimately, really, who can come against you? The, this is the truth on which all of life hangs for the Christian. You need to understand how significant this truth is. When everything else is shaking around you, this truth is a platform. God is for you. Who can be against you? When, when, when you feel like the floor underneath you is giving away, giving away and you are sinking, this truth that we speak of is a lifeboat, a buoy on which you find rescue, in which you find rest, in which you find safety. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also do uh, with him graciously give us all things? 
It's a statement for our, uh, for, 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 uh, on which our logic in following Christ is, is based. Don't, don't you for a second, don't you for even a second, believe the lie that your spirituality is, is, is merely a feeling, has no, no logical basis. Christianity isn't based on, on, on any sort of reality. Don't believe that lie. The rationale for seeking first the kingdom of God can be found in the manger. In a little baby, given as a gift, lying in a manger. You, you ask this question of yourself, I'm sure. In our dark days, we ask this. Is, is God holding out on me? Like, I've wanted a good job, but I've always had a bad job. I've wanted a spouse, but I've always been single. I've wanted to get an education, but I've, I've never had the time or the money or the encouragement. Is God holding out on me? And what Paul's asking today is, do you, do you really think that God is, is going to withhold anything else? Three questions that we're going to answer pretty briefly. Number one, what does it mean that God did not spare his own son? What does that mean? It means that he chose not to spare his own son. That he, that he contemplated it. That he considered it. And then he said, in order for the salvation of the world to come to pass, I'm not going to spare even my own son. The, the father chose to not spare his son from several things. He, he said he, he chose to not spare his son from being lied about. Well, right there, that would be a deal breaker for most of us. We're like, yeah, I'm going to spare my son from being lied about. God chose not to spare his son from being lied about, from being betrayed, from being denied, from being condemned, Spit upon, beaten with whips, mocked, stripped naked in front of thousands of people, slaughtered on a post, and in the pinnacle of everything, and I will turn my back on him. And God considered, God considered what ultimately would be achieved, that, that Jesus' name would be high and lifted up and that we would be saved he considered the, the outcome and he said, I'll do that. God the Father says, I, I, won't, I won't even spare my own son. That's the price I will pay for what will be accomplished. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. Herod and Pilate sentenced Jesus. The Jews and the Gentiles and my own sin, they all crucified Christ. And Christ, and Christ willi willingly submitted himself to the cross. But according to Romans, God determined not to spare his son. Not to spare his one and only son. And that was a choice of infinite and eternal proportions on God's part. So the second question is maybe even a more difficult question to answer. And that is, what does it mean that God will also graciously give us all things? If he's willing to not spare his son... Don't you believe that he's also more than capable, more than able to graciously give you all things? What does that part mean? What is all things? What, what do we need? Look at this passage, 2 Peter 1. It says basically the same thing. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. 
We have received all of this by coming to know Him, God, Christ. He's given us everything we need. It doesn't just say He will. Romans 8 says that. He will graciously. But this one says, actually, He, he has, in the here and the now, He has given you. What you need for this moment, He has given you. What, what you will need tomorrow, He will give you. What you ultimately need for eternity, He will supply that as well. He will graciously give you all things. And at some level, at some logical level, we as Christians, we understand that, we believe that, we realize, you know, I I ate yesterday, I'm going to eat today, I'm going to have what I need tomorrow, I've got a home in heaven. Uh, But at some level, we understand that. But at some other level, we have this deep dissatisfaction and Lydia and I were just talking about this a couple of days ago, and I, I asked her, why don't we believe that? It's right there in Scripture. Most, if not all of us, have testimonies of how God has been faithful every day to date, to this point. So why do we question? Why do we wonder? What's with the dissatisfaction? And as Lydia and I talked about it, I think what we, one, of the, one of the facts that we just landed on is, is this. I think what we fear is what, what God thinks I need and what I think I need are two different things. I think we have this fear that, yeah, yeah God's going to give me what I need. He's not going to give me what I want. And at that moment in time, at that moment, at that crossroads, what we're doing is we're really saying, am I going to seek first God's kingdom? Or or am I going to live in a different economy, in a different system, in a different kingdom, in a a different, um, with different affections and and with with different goals? Or am I going to seek first God's kingdom? Yeah, God's going to give me what I need. In fact, it says everything I need for living a godly life. That's just not what I want. And that again is, is, is crossroads where we have to say, am I going to follow Christ? Am I really going to call myself a Christian? Because if so, then we seek first the kingdom of God. Another way of addressing this question, what does it mean that God will graciously give us all things? Another way of answering that would would, would be this. It it means that all of God's promises, they're for you. They, they, They would not be fulfilled except through Jesus. In other words, when God says, you know, I have I have really good plans for you. And when God says, I I'm, I'm working simultaneously in heaven, preparing for you a home, and on earth, working all things together for your good. And when God says, says, says no one can condemn you, in Christ there is no condemnation. And when God says, you, look at the birds uh, not, not a bird falls from the sky that I don't know it. Nothing happens behind my back. Nothing happens that I'm not aware of. I care for the animal kingdom. And in, in, in an exponentially greater way, I will meet your need. All of the promises of God are for you, but they, they weren't for you until you came under Christ. But now in Christ, all of God's promises, they're for you. 2 Corinthians 1 says it this way, For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. What does it mean that he will graciously give us all things? It means that you can go to scriptures and you can read God's promises and you can say, as a child of God, I find yes to this promise in Jesus. It's fulfilled. Since God did the hard thing, will he not do the easy thing? Will he not graciously give his adopted children? See, you 
You're a, you're a son of the living God. You, you're a daughter of the living God. And that happened because of his sacrifice of his son on the cross. If he did that, adopted you, isn't he going to meet your needs? We sweat so many things. And we sweat it because what we're worried about is, is he going to give me what I want? It's like the, it's like the, it's like the seven-year-old boy. I've, I, I've had three seven-year-old boys. They're all older than that now. It's like the seven-year-old boy. And he worries and he frets and he, he tells me a hundred times, Dad, I want, I want that, <clears throat> I want that Nerf gun. And it's, it's $39.99 at Walmart. Amazon Prime, free shipping, Dad. Right? <laughs> And what, he, and, what he, and what he doesn't know, and there's something precious about the fact that what I don't even tell him at times is that, 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 that I would be happy and willing and able to, to buy him a, a Browning side-by-side 12-gauge shotgun, you know? And, but... But he's worried about that darn $40 Nerf gun. Because sometimes we just, we just don't trust the heart of the Father. I know what I want, and I'm worried, I'm worried he's not going to give it to me. God did the hard thing. Don't you think he'll do the easy thing? He says to us, he says, Randy, God says, Randy, I will work all things for your good. He says, Rick, I am for you. I am, I am not again, I am for you. No one can really oppose you, Rick. He says, Amanda, no one can bring any charge of condemnation against you. Josie, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Ken, no tribulation, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no danger, no sword can really do any lasting damage. In a sense, God says, as my child, you're you're untouchable. God says, Mary, nothing can separate you from all I have in store for you for eternity. We worry about relatively small things, and God says in the birth of the Christ child at Christmas, trust me, I will take care of the small matters. Last question, how do we respond to this? How do we respond to God's gift this Christmas season? And the first answer I would give perhaps need a little, needs a little unpacking. The first answer I would give is we seek first his kingdom. We look at, and if you would just do this in your own heart, we look at our affections. What what really stirs my affections? What really, really gets me out of bed in the morning? What really lights my fire? We look at that and we evaluate, am I seeking first God's kingdom? Maybe you want a, maybe you want a better metric like measuring stick. Maybe you want a better metric than that. And in that case, I would say, I would say, look at your dollars in your days. Look at how you're investing your dollars and look at how you're investing your days. Because, because as I've said, there is a sensibility to seeking God's kingdom. There is a rationale in doing it. So, so therefore, you, you look at your dollars and you look at your days and you say, 
the, the, the rationale for how I'm spending my money, the rationale for, for how I am spending my days, where am I headed? If I, if I look at my, my finances and my time, would anybody reasonably say, if I let them into my world, that I'm seeking first God's kingdom? You know, you know. I don't, I don't know your finances. I don't care to know your finances. You self-evaluate. Um, last night, I was here with my gospel community. And we, we had tamales, and we had pizza, and we had, uh, like, ice cream pie or something. Doesn't that sound good? Uh, and, and sickening all at the same time. Uh, and, 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 and our gospel community is like, there ain't nothing but Jesus that would have brought us together because we're nothing alike. Like we're all just from different walks and, and different backgrounds and, and different everything. But, but Jesus has brought us together as a gospel community. We're talking about a metric with which we can judge whether or not we're seeking God's kingdom, right? And I'm talking about how we spend our hours, how you spend your hours. So, so we're here last night, and, and I'm, it's 7, and then we're, and we're eating, and then it's 7.30. And if you, if, if you know anything about last night, 7.30, what you know is like, they're, so they're going to they're gonna announce who won the, uh, the Heisman Trophy, and, and so, you know, unfortunately, because I hate the Oklahoma Sooners, it was, uh, it was Kyler Murray, Murray, but I think he was deserving. But, but my point is, like, a part of me, part of me wanted to be at home, in front of the TV with my favorite beverage, just hanging out, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, but what I say is, my dollars and my days are going to point in a direction that I want to be headed for eternity. And so I am going to be, I am going to buffet my body, sacrifice myself. I'm going to lock in on this direction. Here's where I'm headed. I'm not just with my dollars and my days. I'm not just going to say, like, just whatever happens, happens. You know, if I wake up and I feel like Fortnite, like, all day, I'll just do Fortnite all day. I don't even know what that means, but it's, it's, I, know, I know it's relevant to the kids, so I thought I'd use that phrase. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to game all day, you know, or, or, or like, it's Sunday, but, but it'd be kind of weird if I was duck hunting, right? But it's Sunday, so I'm not going to go to church. I'm just going to go duck hunt. I'll go to church when duck season's over, but I'm just going to, like, like the, just the path of least resistance, right? And you have it. Every, you have every freedom to live your life like that. But, but today we're evaluating my seeking first God's kingdom. And what I'm here to tell you is there is a rationale. There is something to be gained for that, from that. Gee, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Jesus, in many and various ways throughout his lifetime, he warned us and he encouraged us. He said this. He said, the proud ultimately will be brought low. And he said, ultimately, the humble will be lifted up in God's time, in God's, in the right season, in, in, according to God's plan. And those who, who lay low, those who, who buffet their bodies, those who, like, a, a, like an athlete, they say, I'm going to run after this prize, the kingdom of God. Jesus says, that, that is a smart way to live. There's something to be gained from that. It's not just, just emotions and you just make you feel better. No, Jesus says, you live that way, and, and what you get for eternity is the kingdom of God. God will lift you up. He will esteem you. He will draw you close. There is great gain in following Christ. That great gain, all these things will be added to you as well. <clears throat> Last thought. How do we respond to God's gift this Christmas? We evaluate we look at our dollars and our days. How are you spending your money? How are you spending your time? Last thought is this. We become fearless. 
if there is if there is one main problem, sin, <clears throat> condition within the human heart that I think is the most serious and I think is the most offensive to God, most people would, would, would probably say pride. I would say fear. Fearful. It's... It, it, there are, there are several parables in the Bible, and there's, there are numerous examples in the Bible of how offended God is by our fear. As if to say, as if God says, you don't think I've got this? You don't think that I can, I can close the deal here? I, I, I've gone this far. You don't think I'll carry it the rest of the way? Fear not. Fear not. There's that parable where, where, where the, 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 the wicked servant doesn't invest anything. He just buries it in the ground. And why? He says, because I don't trust you. I'm afraid you're a hard-driving slave master. And so I buried it in the ground. That's how much I'm afraid that you don't got this. And God is deeply, deeply offended. He says, trust me, little child. Fear not. I read you this list just a few months ago, but I'm going to read this again because some of you weren't here and maybe you don't remember it. God says to me today, he says, fear not, because I struggle with fear. And I read this, I read this in the past. I'll, I'll just read it again. In, in 1999, when I quit my my really comfortable church job, church job uh, to be an unpaid worship leader for a, a young church plant. And members of the old church were angry and, and they were ugly about my decision. Um, like the time when Lydia's, uh, when, when, when our third pregnancy ended in a miscarriage. And like the time when I didn't get the job in Minnesota and we'd already sold our house in Albuquerque and, and Lydia was pregnant so we had to go back to Albuquerque and box up everything that we owned and move to another house and I felt really dumb. And like when I sold a business and I didn't get paid the full amount, I was cheated out of what was rightfully mine and God told me, Randy, don't, it's going to be okay. like when my child moved far away and I missed her like I really hadn't never missed a, a child before. And in not sparing his own son, what God says is, Randy, don't be afraid. I've got this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Let's pray.